school. I will dismiss our young people to their Sunday school classes. Second song we sang about a barren land. Right. So true today. Barren, without God, no hope, no future for most of our world. But we have hope and we have a future in Jesus Christ. Right. We can turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Esther. Chapter 2. Esther, chapter 2. We're going to read one verse of scripture there. Esther, chapter 2. We're going to read verse number 17. It says, and the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. We can turn now over to the book of Esther, a couple chapters over to chapter four. We're going to begin reading there at verse number 13. It says, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Then Esther bade them return, Mordecai this answer, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so I will go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went this way, went his way, and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your presence here today, God. We thank you for your blessing and for your mercy upon our lives, for lifting us up, God, and keeping your hand upon us, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would anoint our minds today, guide our thoughts, Jesus. Help us, O oh Lord, to glean from your word today, O oh Lord. God, I ask you to anoint my mind and my lips today, Jesus. We give you all praise, all glory, and all honor. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Our culture today calls them reality shows. Although they're designed to show real, behind-the-scenes life on center stage, few are reality. Right. But the winnings are real. Some shows reward their winners with cash or cars. Others maybe with a fiancé. Others with a brand-new business venture. Talent and music competitions promise recording deals and tours. If you can fillet or lamb bay better than most, you may win the opportunity to run a restaurant or be the top chef at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Several contests still dangle millions of dollars to keep their contestants at the top of their game. The story of, sorry, the story of Esther reads somewhat like a reality show script. A whole harem of women were competing for the king's affection. Right. But the winner did not just walk away with cash or a car. The winner was given the privilege to marry the king himself. Right. Esther entered that contest at the urging of her cousin, and she won. When the royals placed the crown on her head, she was elevated from being Mordecai's cute little cousin to the queen of the entire nation of Persia just seemingly overnight. If you look through the book of Esther, there is not much mention of God. He's absent 
for the entire book. But his power and his footprints are seen throughout its 10 chapters. God protected Esther from her enemies, and because Esther believed in God, God used her and saved her people from annihilation. The people through which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would later be born. Mm -hmm. It's interesting when you look through that book, but you can see, even though they, they don't talk about God, they don't mention God anywhere through it, you can see God working. Right. God doing things in their lives, using them for his purpose, for his pleasure, for what he designed in life. You see, life presents challenging choices to all of us. Famed explorer Captain James Cook learned this firsthand in 1770. His vessel, the HMS Endeavour, crashed into the Great Barrier Reef on June 11th of that year. His wooden vessel stuck fast into the jagged edges of the reef shortly after 11 p.m. Even after 12 hours had passed, the ship was still stuck on the reef, unable to move. Captain Cook faced an almost impossible choice. If he waited, he risked the loss of both ship and crew. Right. Abandoning the ship for the small lifeboats with hopes of making it to shore meant that he and his crew would be forced to remain in Australia for the rest of their lives. Esther faced a similar decision that was filled with uncertainty and little chance of success. Right. Saying nothing meant she and her people were in peril and many would die, but speaking out could also mean death. I believe that this is what we face when we witness, when we knock on doors, when we try to tell people about God, most of the time we look at it as though we have little chance of success. Yeah. We look at people and we identify with them, we look at the way they're dressed, we look at their, their actions through their life, the places that they go and how they treat others around them, and we look at that and we think, oh, there's no chance of this person wanting God. Come on. But if we stay still and we do nothing, we just stand back and let them go, we are condemning them to death. Not uh, a physical death on this world, but an eternal death because we are not sharing what God can do in their lives. Right. We're not telling them about what God wants in their lives. We're not ask, telling them what God can do to lift them up as God once did for us. Right. It's up to us to take and weigh the risks and weigh the rewards and know that when we give and we go out and we talk to people and we share what God can do, that even though there may, be, may seem little chance of success, that if God's will is in it and God's purpose is in it, God will allow it to come to pass and God will begin to work in that person's heart. Right. I don't know how many times that we've, we've gone out and we've talked to people, whether it be in our workplace or, or wherever we are, and we try to tell people about what God can do and we don't see the fruit of our labor. But we don't know what is going on behind the scenes, what God is doing in the lives of those people. Right. I talk to people quite frequently at work, certain people that I talk to and I tell them what God can do. And, and sometimes they come to me and they're joking and they say things. But deep down, I know that God is doing something in their life. I know right. that God is working behind the scenes, that God is slowly changing their heart. And it, it may never come to pass if God tarries, that I may not even see it necessarily but they might one day end up in a place where they are turning their lives over to God. Mm -hmm. We don't know what God is doing, but we can't just sit back and wait and wonder. The message that I would like to speak on for just a little while today is titled, For Such a Time. It's why we're here. Right. For such a time. Just like Esther was... was Mordecai came to her and said to her in verse number, I believe it was verse number 17. Sorry, I just lost my place here. Sorry, no, it was getting myself all confused. Esther chapter 4 and verse number 14. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Right. God has a plan. 
He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is reaching for this world. God is not about to send angels down into this world, although he can, and he could go out and he could reach, he could send an angel into each person's home and could speak to them in the middle of the night and could talk to them and try to convince them that they need to turn their lives over to God, but he's not going to do that. God once came down to this earth and walked among us and began to teach us and began to show us the way because we are the ones that are supposed to be doing that work. We are the ones that were chosen and brought in, brought into that place for such a time as this, that it's up to us now to go forth and be the ones to spread that gospel, to tell people the good news about the word of God, to tell people that God loves them and God cares for them and God is reaching for them Amen. for such a time as this. The story of Esther continues to captivate readers. You see, Esther lived during the reign of the Persian king Ahasuerus, who reigned from 486 to 465 BC. See, Esther lived after the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem in 586 BC, but before the return of Ezra and Nehemiah. It is likely that there was no biblical prophet active within her time period, which might be the reason why there's no mention of God. You see, the prophet Daniel was captive in Babylon as it fell to Persia, but he died shortly after that capture and was not present when Esther's story happened. It appears that Esther and the Jews who remained in Persia were very much alone. Just like it seems for us sometimes, when we go out and when we're doing, try to do a work for God, it seems like we're fighting a losing battle. It feels like sometimes that we are alone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may not hear the voice of God. We may think that we're struggling against the tide waters that are trying to pull us down, but we need to remain faithful. We need to remain focused. And we may need to remain on that course that God has set us on because God doesn't leave us alone. Right. Just like we talked about God may not have been mentioned in the, in the book of Esther. They may not have brought him up. But as you read that book, you can see God's handiwork working. Right. God was still moving in their midst. God was still desiring to, to save his people, to work with his people, even though there was no mention. Esther chapter 2 and verse number 17 that we read says that the king loved Esther above all the women. There's no specific reason given for the king's favor of Esther. They didn't say why he chose Esther above all the rest. If you look into the, the chapter before, it talks about how Queen Vashti, the king was mad at her, and so they came and his court came and said, well, you need to find another wife. You need to raise another woman up to be queen. And, and that pleased the king. And he started working and they started, he said, bring unto me the virgins and bring them in. And they went through a year of purification. And you can read about this and you can see where they was told that they were given anything that they wanted. When they went to go before the king, they would have been given whatever they desired to go in before the king. And we look at our world today. And we see how the world has altered our perceptions on beauty, has altered our perceptions on, on what people should look like and how people should act. And when all we're, doing, all we're called to do is to be godly and to be holy and to be what God has called us to be. And Esther showed her obedience to her cousin by going into that place and becoming one of those that would stand before the king and hopefully be chosen by the king. And we can read in the Bible that says that Esther was a beautiful young woman but we know that it's likely that the other women that were there as well were also beautiful young women. Right. They were all vying. They were all competing. They were all desiring to become the next queen. And it was going to be the one that the king desired to choose that was going to be the one to be his queen. More likely, we can look and see that it was probably her demeanor and her disposition there were key factors in the king choosing her. Right. It's likely that the wisdom that she displayed in taking nothing into her visit with the king, except for what the king's chamberlain suggested. If you look back in verse number 15 of chapter 2, it says that when she went to go before the king, he told her what to take with her. 
when they could have taken anything that they wanted. In the, in earlier in that chapter, you can read how the Chamberlain also, Esther had found favor in his sight. And he began to elevate her in, in the house, began to elevate her by giving her other women to help her to make her what she needed to be over and above what these others were. She was chosen and she was favored. And that was not a coincidence. It was because of God working in her life. Right. It was because God was doing things in her that it wasn't just her that was doing it, but God was setting events in motion to allow her to be in that right place for such a time as she needed to be there, as Mordecai had said. You see, the, the Chamberlain knew the king probably better than anybody else there. He knew what the king was looking for. He knew what the king desired. He knew who the king would think was beautiful. He knew what the king would like and dislike. And so he set Esther up to win this competition. Right. He put her in a position that was going to allow her to be there. God's hand was at work because God could have saved his people using another method. But God chose to use Esther. Esther's selection by the king was part of God's plan. Right. That's the thing that we, we need to understand is that we live this life and we live in this world and, and we go about our daily life doing what we think we want to do, but we need to also realize that we are part of God's plan. Right. We need to realize that we need to be seeking God's will and desiring to be used of him if we're going to, if we're going to do the things that are going to be pleasing to God. We can make a decision and we can leave God completely out of it. And I found in my own life that sometimes when we do that, those decisions fail. Right. Because that wasn't God's plan. But when we give things to God and when we seek God and when we desire to live life to please him, God gives us favor. Yes. I was speaking to somebody here a little while back. I don't even remember who it was now. And we were talking about where I work. And I've been in my job now for 13 and a half years. We've watched the economy go up and we've watched the economy go down. And through those 13 and a half years, Gibraltar Mine has always managed to, to stay working, to stay going. And we may have had to lay people off along the way. We've hired people back. But we've always been able to maintain. We've always been able to keep going. And I never really thought about it, but the person I was talking to it's because you look around and, and many other mines in the area have failed. They weren't able to keep going when the downturn happened, but Gibraltar kept on going. Mm -hmm. And the person said, do you ever wonder why maybe God's got you in a position there? Maybe God brought you into that place and maybe it's God's favor upon your life, being faithful to him, that has kept that place blessed right. and kept that place going. And I don't remember who, I wish I could remember who it was because they were in the same situation. In the, in the business and the career that they were in, it was the same thing. Through these downturns, their competitors were falling away by the wayside. But the business where he was at managed to keep going and staying up and didn't get affected nearly as bad as others, as their competitors around them. He says it's because of the blessing of God upon our lives that is actually blessing other people's lives around us because yes. God is working in it. You see, we have been chosen to serve the true and one king. Esther was chosen to serve an evil king in a foreign land. And as saints of God, we live in a foreign land. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. Right. We need to live lives that are separated, apart from this world. Even though we go to work every day in the world, we go shopping every day in the world, we're around people of the world every day, we need to realize that we are not of this world. But we are here and we serve a king, the righteous king, the holy king, the right. one true yeah. king, and we serve and we live for him. And it's easy for us as children of God to forget that we live for him. We are, too many people are are guilty that they think that the church and even God exist for them. God doesn't exist for us. The church doesn't exist for us. But we are to be servants. That's where true joy, peace, and contentment are found, when we embrace the fact that we are God's servants. Right. Even the prodigal son came to this realization. He lived in a house where he had everything. 
All that he desired, it was all there for him. If he wanted money, I'm sure his dad gave him money. If he wanted to buy things, I'm sure his dad gave him, bought him whatever he wanted. He had everything that he could ever want, but he said that wasn't good enough. And he decided to leave his father's house. He said, I want my, the half of my inheritance that is mine, and I want to go. Mm -hmm. And the father let him go. And it wasn't until that everything was gone and, every, and he realized when he went out into the world that the world was not going to fulfill what it was that he was looking for. When he realized the world had nothing for him, when the world was all like, trying to tear him down, then he was serving and he was eating the pigs and, and giving the food to the pigs and uh, looking at the, the corn husks and everything else thinking, even the servants in my father's house eat better than this. Amen. They have it better than what I've got it right now. And he humbly went back to his father, went back to his, the home where he, he left everything behind and he realized, I just want to be a servant in my father's house. Right. And his father didn't leave him as a servant in his house, but elevated him back to his position. But that's where we find that joy and that peace is realizing that God doesn't live for us, isn't there for us, but we're here for God. When we realize that we've got it wonderful as his servants, that we've got the blessings as his servants, that we've got a father in heaven above that cares for us, that he will give us the things that we need every single day if we just desire to serve him. And then you realize that I don't need to be in control. I don't need to be the one making all the decisions. I can allow God to make the right decisions right. for me. I can allow God to help me through this life and God will work in me and God will bless me and God will keep me. And then we realize that a lot of our fear, a lot of our anxiety goes away because God is in control by serving him. Amen. In Romans chapter 6 and verses 15 to 23, Paul clearly articulated that people will be servants of something. You're never in control of your life. You need to realize that no matter where you are in this world, you are not the one controlling your life. You may think that you're in control. You may think that the decisions that you're making are your decisions. But one way or another, you are serving a master. One master or the other. There are only two that we serve. We're either servants of sin, leading to physical and spiritual death, or servants to righteousness, leading to holiness and life everlasting. Right. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 to 23. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Did you catch that? You were the servants of sin, Right. But being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You weren't just set free to go do what you want to do. You went from servant of sin to a servant of righteousness. Right. Verse 19 says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity to iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The choice that we have, the decision that is ours to make, is who are we going to serve? Right. And when you decide which one you want to serve, then you become a servant to that master. We have a choice today. We can serve God, or we can think that we're in control and do the things of the world, but all we're doing then is serving flesh and serving sin. Esther chose to serve God by obeying her uncle Mordecai and submitting to the king's rule. And we are blessed when we obey godly elders and godly authority. That's why God set up the authority in the church. 
is for us to come under their authority and under their jurisdiction, and we are blessed when we submit to that, when we're obedient to that. Today's, in today's culture, they, people don't want to hear about obedience. People don't want to hear about submission. It's not comfortable for either one of those things. Obedience and submission to godly authority are two of the most counter-cultural topics in our world today, but they are biblical principles. Right. We need to submit. We need to obey the word of God. We need to obey our godly elders in our church, our pastors, and those that are above us in authority. Submission is not blind obedience devoid of thought or emotion. Submission is obeying God's word when the natural man, when your flesh does not want to obey. Submission is following God and his word even when the outcome does not seem clear from our human perspective. Sometimes we go, why do I need to do that? Sometimes we don't need, we, even though the question arises in our mind, we need to say, well, if it's written in the word of God, if it's the right. word of God that's telling it us, to us, we need to obey it because we don't know necessarily or we may never know the actual whys as to why God is doing something. But we need to trust God and know that his way is perfect and his way is right. And he's not going to lead us down a garden path somewhere, but we need to be obedient and submitted to what his word says. The world around us thinks it's, that submission is strange. Even in our... <laughs> Even if you look at just the family unit. Children are supposed to submit themselves to their parents, but now the world around us has given our children more power and authority over the parent. They're destroying the principles of God. You look at what's been going on in the last couple of years, in, mostly down in the U.S., but now even this creeping up into Canada is submission to authority in our world even. People are wanting to defund the police. They're wanting to destroy that authority. They're wanting to take that away and just let... Them, their own lives rule what they think is right and wrong, which again is against the word of God. The world right now is throwing off all restraints, saying just be free, be you. You make your own choices. Whether it be changing your gender or whether it be defunding the police and, and having no respect for authority in your life, the world is destroying all these principles of God that have been laid out. And we don't even realize a lot of these things that are principles of God that have been put in place over the years by people that love God. Mm -hmm. our, our countries and our constitutions were written and made by people that serve God. And they want to destroy those things because the enemy is trying to destroy God's plan. It comes down to a choice as to who we're going to bow down to what we're going to worship, what we're going to allow in our lives to have control over our lives. And Mordecai refused to bow before Haman. Go back to the book of Esther, chapter 3. Haman got mad because Mordecai refused to bow down to him. Esther, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. So says that when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even the people of Mordecai. When he realized that Mordecai was a Jew, Haman was the one who was elevated to senior command under under the king. He was the one that had authority. He was the one that had that could do things and he started doing things and when he instructed the people that they needed to show him reverence because of his position, because of his authority and Mordecai looked at him and said, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not bowing down to anything. Right. I'm not bowing down to your rules. I'm not bowing down to you as a man. I will bow down to my God and I will serve my God, and I will follow his rules and his commandments. I'm not going to bow down, and I'm not going to worship anything but him. And that made Haman mad because here Mordecai was setting an example. Here Mordecai was making a stand for what was right. And then when he found out that he was a Jew, he said, I'm not just going to destroy Mordecai, but I want to destroy all the Jews. Now, it doesn't explicitly say why Mordecai refused to bow. 
But as you look through your Bible, you can find other examples of where there's others that would not, especially in that time frame, that would not bow to anything other than to God. Mm -hmm. We know about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know about Daniel, who, as we learned at the beginning of the message, had come just shortly before this time. I'm sure that they would have heard about these these young men who would not bow and who would not bend, and, and he might have used them as that example and said, I want to be like them. Right. I want to have a conviction like them. I want to have a, a faith in God just like they had. They, in a foreign land, in a foreign place, under, under foreign rule, he refused to bow. He said, I'm not going to bow. They refused to bow and worship towards anything other than God. He was not going to pay homage to Haman. He was not going to bow down to him. He was not going to show him obedience, but he was only going to trust in God. Right. You see, at this point, they still didn't know who Esther was. They didn't know her background because before she went in to be chosen as, as queen, before she went into that place, Mordecai had instructed her do not tell them who your family was. Do not tell them what your background was. They didn't know she was a Jew. They didn't know she was connected to Mordecai. They didn't know this at that point in time. But our enemy, just like Haman, wanting to destroy the Jews out of that time, the enemy wants to destroy us because we don't bow down to the things of the world, because we don't chase after those things, and he wants to get into our lives, and he wants to pull us away from God, and he wants to take us our attention away from God, and wants to take away our worship. The enemy wants our worship. Right. Yeah. See, the adversary is not content to see people suffer from bad choices and sinful decisions. He wants our destruction. He wants to destroy us utterly and completely. He says the one thing that I think that Satan does know, because we know that Satan is not God, God sees the beginning from the end. God knows everything that's happening, everything that's going on around us. Satan has the same capacity and, and foreknowledge that we have. We don't know tomorrow. Right. But I'm sure God has told him what his outcome is going to be. God has forewarned him about the place that he's prepared for him. And all he wants is to take as many of us with him as he can. Right. He wants us destroyed. Not just living in sin, not just making bad decisions, not just suffering the outcome of our bad decisions, but he wants to destroy us. And he wants to take our worship from us. The initial complaint against Mordecai from Haman was that he would not bow and pay homage to him. He was looking for Mordecai's worship. Show how great and wonderful I am. Bow down before me. And, sh and show obeisance to me, and give your worship to me. And the lack of respect may have seemed like a small thing, but to someone like Haman, it was not. He was not giving it to anybody but God. And whichever master you decide to serve, whether you're choosing to serve sin or whether you're choosing to serve God, the master that you're serving knows whether you are worshiping him or not. Mm -hmm. They know what it is that you are doing in your life. They, they know what it is that you're offering to them. The enemy seeks our worship. Often he will settle for God's people not giving the worship to God that he deserves, but the enemy's ultimate aim is to receive allegiance to himself, right. that we would worship him through our actions, that we would worship him through our speech, that we would worship him through our dress, that we would worship him in all aspects of our lives and that's the thing with God is that God, we think about worship as when we come into a church service and we lift up our hands and we sing songs to him, but our lives are a worship to God. How we dress, where we choose to go and not go, the things that we, that we say as when we talk to people, how we address people, how we treat people, all that is shown as a worship to God. Right. The way we live becomes that worship. The, who we are becomes that worship. doesn't matter where we are, what's going on in our lives. We need to understand that our lives need to worship God. We need to sometimes make a stand. 
And then in the time in which we find ourselves living today, it's going to be of utmost important that we understand who it is that we are worshiping, right. who it is that we are serving. And what's going on in this world today, we, it's incredible to think about the fact that right now we're laying our heads down on nice soft pillows and nice comfy beds and in a warm house. And the people of Ukraine are huddling, hiding in subway tunnels to stay away from air attacks, sleeping on concrete. And we say, well, we pray for them, which is a good thing to do, but what happens when that comes to our house? What happens when that comes to our neighborhood? What happens when that becomes a part of our life? Are we just going to forget what God has done in our lives? Are we going to forget about the blessings of God upon our lives? Or are we going to trust in him and believe in him and know that he's going to take care of us and know that, he's going to, that we need to make a stand for what God is doing right. and what God has done and who God is? You see, the book of Esther is about God's people being delivered from their enemies, but the battle is recorded, that is recorded in Esther began when one man refused to bow. Mm -hmm. That's when the battle started. That's when all of a sudden it came to the reality that suddenly, because he, Haman was content to just let the people go and do their lives as long as they would bow down to him. But when one man decided to make a stand and said, no. Right. You look at our, even just our, where the, I don't know what everybody's stance is on the freedom convoy. But you can see what happened when some group of people stood up and said, no. Right. We need to end these mandates. We need to end these things that are going on. And this group of people joined together and stood up for it. And then the division that it's created, you can see that because people are making a stand for what they believe is right, that's when the battle begins. Right. You see, we need to realize that our worship matters to God. We may feel insignificant on one person. What difference is that going to make? But every individual's worship is paramount in the kingdom of God. God is looking for each one of us as individuals, not just as a body of Christ, but each one of us on our own to worship God, to be effective in the kingdom of God. You see, every time that we worship God, the enemy is defeated. Right. He doesn't have control of our lives when we worship God. He doesn't have control of our thoughts when we worship God. He doesn't have control of, of, of what the things that we're doing when we're worshiping Him. The battle that the Jews would fight and win years later was begun by one man who refused to bow. And his first act of, def of defiance set the tone and was crucial in their victory. Because had they just bowed down and done what it was that they were expected to do, they would have never been free. They would have never gotten out of where they were. They would have never been set free from their bondage. But when you just, when you offer your life to God and you offer that worship to Him, that's when chains begin to fall. That's when things begin to happen in your life because the enemy cannot hang on to you when you're worshiping God. When you're giving your life to Him, that's when the enemy has no grip on you anymore. That's when the enemy cannot have any more control over you. And he can't do things in your life anymore as you're worshiping God. Once long ago, there was a poor beggar in a far country. He sat each day on the corner begging for rice. One day, an unassuming stranger passed by and asked the beggar for a piece of the rice that he had received that morning. The beggar consented, realizing that all that he had possessed had been given to him. He'd been begging for the rice. And people had given him a little bit. He didn't earn that rice that had been given. So he felt, well, then I need, somebody's asking of me, I need to give. Later in the day, the same scenario occurred again. This time the beggar reluctantly consented. And finally, near the end of the day, the stranger appeared again and once more asked for rice. And the beggar was indignant. How can I survive if I continue to give you all the rice that I collect? The stranger smiled and asked the beggar if he had checked his bowl from the morning. Pulling the bowl down off the ledge, he peered in and was stunned by what he saw. For every grain of rice the that the stranger had taken, in its place, he left a diamond. You see, when you give your praise to God, right. you gain vastly more than what it is that what you have given. When we lift up our praise to God, when we lift up our worship to Him, He blesses us far more than what we're offering to Him. Right. 
How many times have we come into a church service and we're tired? And maybe we're beat down from the day or we're beat down from the week. And I just don't feel like singing those songs. I don't really feel like lifting my hands up to him today. But through all of that, we know this is what I need to do. Through all of that, we know that, we, that we're here for a reason. And that reason is for God. Right. And we put aside our tiredness and we put aside our weariness. We put aside being beat down and we just say, God, I just need a touch from you today. And as we begin to lift up our voices and we lift up our hands to him, and suddenly we feel that Shekinah presence come in and God starts to move upon your life. And when you leave that service, you feel energized and you feel refreshed because right. God blessed you through that yeah. obedience. God blessed you through that worship. And we leave with far more than what just a matter of lifting up our hands are and opening up our hearts are and just singing a few songs to God. But by allowing that worship to go to him because he is deserving of it. I've heard stories about people that have gone through terrible loss that have walked into a church service and before they've done anything, they walked up to the altar and just lifted up their hands and began to give the God thanks. When all the people around them are all amazed, thinking, I'm surprised they even came to church today because of the pain that they're going through. I'm surprised with all the hurt and all that they've endured over the last few weeks that they would come into this place, but they knew where the blessings came from. They knew the God that they served and they trusted in that God that they served, that God didn't caused them pain, but they were God was still worthy of all the praise and all of the glory. So they walked in and they began to lift up their hands and they began to worship God with all that they had. And it didn't just touch them, it touched everybody around them. Right. That's the thing about our worship is when we offer up with a with with abandon, we just don't care what the person next to us is doing, what they're thinking. What they're, if they just want to sit on their chair, but we say, no, I'm here to worship God. Right. I'm here to offer my life to God. I'm here to allow God to move. Amen. And they, and we just begin to, with, with complete abandon, just an unashamedness, just lift up and worship God. Suddenly, that starts, you feel the Spirit of God come into the house. You feel as God moves around, touching people. And pretty soon, you look around, and others are lifting up their hands, and others are worshiping God, and other lives are being affected by that. It's not just you who receives a blessing. You see, as we mentioned at the beginning, Esther faced a challenging choice. It was Mordecai who refused to bow. And that set in motion a series of events where Haman was able to leverage his influence to have the king issue an edict with instructions to annihilate the Jews. Again, the king didn't know that Esther was a Jew. I'm sure Haman didn't know that Esther was a Jew. And that's when Esther was faced with the decision of her life. You see, Mordecai knew of the decree and began wandering in the city with sackcloth, mourning because of what would befall God's people. We look at Esther chapter 4 and verse number 1. It says, when Mordecai I perceived that all was done, Mordecai I rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. But it says, it goes on in that chapter to say that Esther sent clothes to Mordecai for him to wear. Take off your sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. He wouldn't accept the clothes that Esther sent out. And this echoes, it sheds a little bit of light on the words of Mordecai to Esther just a short time later in the chapter. You see, Esther, Mordecai had already set things in motion. Mordecai had already done enough to get things going that, that Haman was looking to annihilate the Jews. And maybe Esther at that point in time was saying, okay, Mordecai, that's enough. You need to stop now. You need to stop drawing attention to yourself. You might. You need to stop. We just need to let this thing pass over. And maybe she was thinking that because she was in the king's house that maybe nothing would happen. Maybe she could do something because she was the queen, you see. But Mordecai challenged any notion of self-preservation that would be gained by not taking a stand. Maybe God will come in and, and will save us through some other means, Esther. But you and your father's house and your family are not going to escape. Mm -hmm. Not this time. 
says, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews, for if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance also arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. Right now, Esther, you need to make a choice. You need to make a stand. You need to make a decision now, Esther. What are you going to do? Being silent and fearful while hiding and hoping for the best was not the solution for this challenge. You see... Esther realized that her life was going to hang in the balance because Mordecai was instructing Esther, you need to go talk to the king. And Esther knew that nobody could go into the king's chamber unless they were invited. Esther knew that, that it, she said it had been, I believe it says that she had been 30 days since she had been invited into the king's chamber. I can't go there, Mordecai. I, I can't just step into that place. I can't just go in there if I'm not invited because if he doesn't hold down that golden scepter, if he doesn't acknowledge that I'm okay in this place, then I'm going to die and I'm going to lose my life. But the Bible also says that she heeded the words of Mordecai and prepared for battle in the way that we should prepare for battle. Right. Through prayer, and fasting. Sometimes we wonder why we can't get the victory. Sometimes we wonder why things or events are happening in our lives and we just can't seem to get past them. Jesus said, some things come forth not but by prayer and fasting. Sometimes we need to show that sacrifice. We need to allow that to be that avenue and that, that venue that we use to be able to have God's will done in our lives. And we break down and we say enough is enough. I need to get into the will of God. I need to have, know that God is hearing me. I need to know that God is working on our behalf and we need to pray and we need to fast and we need to get into that, not allow our, our flesh to rule, but to push that down so that we can walk in the spirit so we can hear God and know what God is doing. Her life was on the line so she choose, chose to pray and called for a fast for herself and her staff. And it was only after praying and after fasting that she approached the king. Mm -hmm. Now, whether her, it was her prayer and her fasting that gave her the resolve to just do what was necessary, or whether it was just God opening the door. But it says that she approached the king and was pleased, and the king was pleased with her and held out his gold, uh, held out to her the golden scepter. But said, Esther then invited the king and Haman to a banquet, but did not reveal her request during her first meal. Instead, she invited the king and Haman to another banquet the following day. And in all of this, you can see God's power working. You can see what God was doing in their lives and how God was orchestrating things and how God was doing things that they may not have even understood or seen at that time. And that's what God does in our lives when we fast and we pray. As, as God is working around us, we don't see the spiritual things in our life. We don't see the battles that are raging around us when the enemy is trying to come in and attack our mind. But through our prayer and through our fasting and through our worship, that we've got angels around us that are fighting those battles around us and protecting our minds and protecting our hearts and keeping the enemy at bay. And through this, we can see where God was beginning to work. Because on that night, the king could not rest. Why? Why couldn't the king rest? Because Esther was praying, because Esther was fasting, and God was working. So in, because of the fact that he couldn't sleep, he instructed his servants to read to him the records of his kingdom. And maybe they selected some records, thinking, oh, this will be boring, and the king will just fall asleep. However, the king could not fall asleep, because in those records... A story was revealed about a man who uncovered an assassination plot and was never rewarded for his service. And in the morning, the king called for Haman to get suggestions about what to do for one so deserving of honor. That man was Mordecai. Right. Mordecai was then honored by the king for his service. You can imagine 
what Haman was thinking at that time. So he brought Mordecai in and honored him. Then the king and Haman returned for the evening banquet with Queen Esther, where she told the king of the danger to herself and to her people, people finally revealing to the king who she was. This decree that went forth, king, was to destroy the Jews. And that's my people, because I am a Jew. So you're going to destroy me. You're going to destroy my family. You're going to destroy Haman. You're going to destroy Mordecai, whom you just honored for his acts of bravery and, and for saving this kingdom. And the king was outraged and ordered Haman to be hanged. You see, through... Esther's fasting, through Esther's desiring to pray, through that boldness that she received to be able to go in and, and make that, that step of faith, trusting God, going into the king's chamber, even though she knew that she could die, was rewarded by God. Haman had built gallows outside of his home in an effort to hang Mordecai would later be hanged on those very same gallows. Right. It represents perfect justice by God and against the enemies of his people. You see, God cares for his people. God will take care of, of us when we don't understand what's going, around, going on around us, when we feel like we're being persecuted, when we feel like we don't know where to turn because the enemy is on every side, God is there. Right. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse number 19 says, so, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. That's a verse that we can put our faith in. That's a verse that we can put our trust in. And when we face things in our lives and we don't know where to turn and we don't know where to go and we feel like we're being pressured on all sides by the enemy, that's when we get on our knees and that's when we begin to pray. That's when we begin to fast because that's when the Spirit of the Lord will come in and raise up a standard against that enemy. That's when the, the angels of God will come in and begin to protect us. And the angels of God will be in that battle with us and we don't have to do it alone. Right. There is no better action than to trust God to fulfill his word and keep his promises. God does not change. The same yesterday, today, and forever. His promises we can believe in, we can trust in, and we can know that he's going to allow them to come to pass. And we have been called to work in this kingdom. Today, now, this time, for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. And just as Esther found herself in the kingdom at the right time, we need to realize that we are here for this time, for the right time. We're called of God to place all of our faith in him, even in the, if the, we go through difficult and trying times because we're here for such a time. As we stand together today, most of us have moments when we think it would have been easier or perhaps more exciting to live in another time of history. I know of late, when, as with different things that have been going on in the world around us, I was thinking it would have been nice to have been born a generation earlier. Maybe not have to go through the things that we might have to go through. Face the things that we're facing in our world today. Come in during a time when people were a little more hungry for the things of God. But I wasn't born then. Right. I was born when I was born. For such a time as this. Certainly what God has done in the past is exciting. and What God plans to do in the future is wonderful. But we are living in the here and now in this time, in this place, chosen of God. And again, it comes back down to the fact that we are here to be servants. God's not here for us, we're here for God. Right. It's important for us to be in the word of God and say, God, what do you want us to do? And we do our best to witness, we do our best to testify, we do our best to reach out, but we need to continue that. 
When we seem like the odds are against us, when people don't seem like they want God, we need to keep pressing forward, keep right. pushing on, keep sharing the word of God. What we do with this gift testifies of our attitude towards God. Right. Let us live our lives in such a way that our lives say thank you to God for allowing us to be alive right now in this time and in this place. We need to trust that we're alive at exactly the right time in history and that no accident, that it is no accident that we're living for God in this present moment. Right. Because God called us here for such a time. It reminds me of the story of Corey Temple. And they were living in Holland. They were just living their lives when Hitler's army came in and they began to persecute the Jews. They began to push them down. And her and her family began to take them in and create a hiding space in their home to be able to hide some of these people from persecution and, and hide some of these people. And, and they, got, they got caught doing what they were doing. And they got put into a prisoner of war camp. Right. And Corey Ten Boom's attitude and position was, we're here for a reason. Yeah. And they began to share the word of God with the other women that were there with them and began to encourage them and began to strengthen them and began to help put that word of God into their hearts so that they could trust in God and they could believe in God. And I don't know what the future is going to hold. I don't know what is coming our way. I don't know where we're going to end up or what's going to happen. But I just know that we need to trust in God and know that we are called to be here for this time, that, that we need to be an encouragement to the people around us and we need to be able to, be again, be a light to the world around us, right. showing our faith to, to the world, not sitting back and appearing to be as them because we might be different, not sitting back and, and just allowing things to flow around us, but standing for what is right. right. Standing for what the word of God says. Because we're called to be here for such a time. And we need to believe that and embrace it. Why don't we pray today and just ask God. Just ask him to help you in whatever aspect of your life. God, how can I be a light to the world around me? Jesus. How can I be an Esther? How can I be the one to, to know what is right, to know what to do, to be able to make a stand even though that stand may not be comfortable, but to trust in God in, in all aspects of our lives yes. and to believe that God has put you in a position. I can't reach the people that you can, you can't reach the people I can but we're all put in a position to reach those around us, to be a light to those around us, right. to show God to the world around us. Let's just take a few minutes, and just pray and talk to God. Lord, I thank you, Jesus. You are mighty God. You are wonderful.